Our next speaker is um, Mike Croto. Mike is the president of the United Steelworkers Local 36, um, who represents the workforce at Madison Paper, and um, um, which many of you may have seen in the news unexpectedly to many people, um, announced that it will close in May, just, just last week announced that it will close in May. So that's going to be a huge impact in that town, that community, and that river valley. Um, we had asked Mike to speak quite some time ago um, just because of some other interesting things that the workers and the management at that mill had been um, engaged in relative to the trade agreements. So um, we're extra happy to have him here tonight um, to acknowledge that those workers are going through a hard time and going to be going through a much harder time. Um, and please uh, make welcome Mike Croto. Thanks, Cynthia. Everybody hear me all right? I'm not used to microphones. I just holler really loud usually. <laughs> uh, like she said, I'm, I'm the president of Local 36, United Steel Workers. I represent 122, 123 members of the 214 people that are getting ready to lose their jobs the end of May. Uh, but what I came to talk to you tonight, what we discussed before we found out 10 days ago we're going to lose our mill, was two and a half years ago, three, well, three and a half years ago now, that we found out about a guy named Ron Stern up in Canada. And he went to the Canadian government and said, hey, I'll buy that Port Hawkesbury mill for you, and I'll start it back up, and I'll produce all kinds of paper, but you've got to give me all kinds of subsidies, because I'm not going to do it for free. The Canadian government said, we're not interested in doing that. So he went to the Nova Scotian province and said, you guys give me all kinds of tax breaks and free money and so forth and so on. I'll start your mill back up, and I'll put 400 workers back to work. And I believe when that mill was in full operation, it was a little over 600. They agreed to do that. And they agreed to put super calendared paper back into a market that is already overinflated, oversupplied. And for the folks that don't know what super calendared paper is, the best way I can explain that is when you open your newspaper and you see a Rite Aid ad, or you see a Target ad, or a Best Buy ad, or if you look at a Northern Tool magazine, that's super calendared paper. Okay? And it was actually SEA grades. So the Nova, Go Nova Scotia government said, yeah, we'll do that. So Madison Paper Industries, which is owned by UPM, Kaimin, in, in Finland, joined forces with Verso, because they own a super calendared mill in Duluth, Minnesota. There's only two super calendared mills in the United States. So we joined forces, created a coalition, filed the countervailing duty case or CVD case against, the way it works is we couldn't just file it against Port Hawkesbury. We had to file it against all super calendared uh, manufacturers in Canada, which there's four. You had the Port Hawkesbury mill, you had Irving, and you have Catalyst, Ron's company, and you had Resolute. And that's the way it had to, that's just the way the trade agreements work. The bad part about that is with the trade laws that we have, we had to show significant damage and we had to build that. It took us over two years to build that case. So we're struggling trying to keep our head above water for two years while there's a mill in Canada getting $125 million plus dollars in unfair trade subsidy dollars, money, to run and shipping 300, it's a little over 300,000 ton a year of super calendared paper into the U.S. market that we really don't need anyways. Uh, the market has been declining at a rate of 11, uh, 10 to 15 percent a year. Um, full out, if my mill runs nonstop, we only produce 210,000 ton a year. So we're building this case for two years, right? And for the first time, as long as we've been Madison Paper Industries, my membership had to endure layoffs that weren't production, uh, weren't mill improvement layoffs. The first time the mill wasn't putting money into the mill to make it better, so people had to be laid off. So unfortunately, that, that last year, I had to become an expert in unemployment to take care of my membership, because I had members that had been in that mill for over 30 years, had never filed an unemployment claim in their lives. So you know, it really, we really saw the impact. So we did that. <coughs> Corporate, the UPN Corporation stood behind us. We built the case. We built it for two years. We took the hits. We took a cost-neutral contract, first time we'd ever done that. So our members lost there. 
And we said, you know, this is for the better good of our mill and the better good of our community to stay alive. Um, with the support of uh, Senator King, the support of Senator Collins, and the, a lot of support from Congressman Poliquin, we went down to D.C. We testified in front of the International Trade Commission, and we won. We thought, you know, hey, we won. They imposed duties on all four mills, with Port Hawkesbury being the mill that was uh, taxed the highest at 20 percent, and Resolute at, I think it was 17 percent, and the other two was the average of around 18 percent. We thought, that's great. We've won. We've, we survived. We did what we had to do. We played by the rules. We did what the U.S. government told us to do with the trade laws that are in place, and now we got a chop. Now we got a chance. We thought we had it. It didn't work out. I can't tell you why my mill's closing. <clears throat> you know, what happens is we went through this ourselves. Rumford had to file a case. There's been lots of cases. USW uh, hires attorneys, very expensive. And the first time we won one of these cases, we went, well, the first time we went to try to do it, we went to DC. And what happens is you testify in front of the uh, Department of Commerce and the International Trade Commission. And they'll say, yes, we can see that these other countries are cheating. They're illegally subsidizing. They're dumping their goods on your market. They're giving free shipping for this stuff to come over from China. Paper's very heavy. It doesn't make sense they can put it over here cheaper than what we can make it. So after we, we, we show them that they're cheating, they said, but you can't show us there's any harm. What's the harm? So we had to wait two years and show them afterwards how many mills are going down. Once we showed them the mills went down, we had to go back and do that again. And the folk delegation uh, showed up and testified. It was before uh, Bruce got into office. And the delegation did a fantastic job. And, and we won the case then. But in the meantime, the damage is done. We lost three or four mills right then, and we've been losing more since. Part of what happens, like with Mike's mill, I believe, is during this time, you're losing orders because it's being flooded from other places. Once these other customers get used to buying paper from other places, it's hard to get them to come back to your mill. Now you've only got 40 or 60 percent of the, of the customers that you had before. The only way a paper mill, a, a huge mill, big operation, the only way it's going to make any money is you have to run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can't be shutting down and laying off your members two to three weeks at a time, four or five times a year, and expect you're going to survive. When you get into that mode, the writing's on the wall. And you think for a minute, is it just Madison? Well, Emory D Bay over here is from Bucksport. What happened to your mill, Emory? How many people? How many people? And then there's Millinocket, East Millinocket. At one time, the two mills in the Millinockets employed about 4,000 people. Is that right, Troy? And we lost those mills. And one of those mills was actually very modern and a pretty nice mill. Then after that, we lost the, uh, we lost the Lincoln Mill, and we've lost the Old Town Mill. And Brewer was before that. And, yeah. Yeah, so we can keep naming it. Goes If you go back far enough, there's all the old Projepskit mill. There's all kinds of old mills. And then if you step outside the paper industry, we've already lost textile a long time ago. My wife used to work in shoes, and she made a good living. Her and her brother both made a good living doing shoes. But we shipped that all overseas. And you know what? When those shoes come back here now, you pay more than before they went over. Instead of paying uh, uh, $40 to make a pair of sneakers, not, now you're paying like $80. Where's that profit going? It's not coming back here cheaper. It's the corporations that's getting that money. And a lot of those corporations are main corporations. We got rapid response. We got the Career Center. We got the AFL-CIO supporting us. We're gonna, they're going to come into our mill. They're going to take care of our members. They're even going to take care of our managers. They're going to take care of the IAM members. Unfortunately, you know, and a lot of us, we're going to be able to move on. We're going to be able to find jobs and be successful. And, you know, hopefully it's in the state of Maine. Hopefully it's in our area. Some people will leave. But the fact of the matter is, the town of Madison won't be the same. 